Well, hey, a very warm welcome to each and every one of you here if you're in the room or if you're joining us online this weekend. We're so thankful that you are streaming with us, no matter where it is that you are around the world or whether you're here in Colorado and uh, you're on the trail right now. No judgment, no judgment. We're so glad you're with us. Can we welcome those online with us right now? Come on, Mount Springs. Let's just say thanks for joining us this weekend online. You're joining us as we continue along in a series that we have that we're going through the Gospel of John. And so if you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and turn with me to John chapter 11. John chapter 11, we have about 10 weeks or so remaining in this series. We've been in it now for many months and it will go through the end of the month of August. And essentially as we kind of have around 10 or so weeks left, I thought we'd spend some time as we kick off this message this weekend, really by kind of talking about what it is that you can expect between now and the end of the series. Number one, you can expect a systematic and a sequential walk through the Word of God, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. We want to immerse ourselves in the reality of the revelation of God's Word, but also a tackling of every thought and situation. And we're trying to do our absolute best to not skip over anything. Some weekends that is easier than others, and other weekends that is quite a challenge to where we can cover every verse and dig into it some weekends. We're covering around 57 or so verses, to be precise, 57 or so verses, thereabouts. Lots of verses, lots of material. But anyway, this weekend, we're going to be covering the first 44 verses of chapter 11 in John's Gospel. And frankly, what is my prayer? My prayer as we go through this series is simply this, that we would have a growing faith in God, that we would recognize that we can find life in Christ. In fact, so much so, when John the Apostle put pen to papyrus, if you will, in terms of the penning of this euangelion, he writes this there in John 20, verse 31. This is all written, he writes, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name, life in his name. Well, sure enough, life in his name is the theme of this weekend's message as we're looking at a moment packed full of bereavement, loss, joy, emotion, fatigue, uh, incredible tears, and a crying out for God to do the miraculous. And actually, aside from the resurrection miracle, this will be the final miracle that we'll look at in John's Gospel. It will be the seventh of seven miracles, and much like the first miracle that occurs in John 2, uh, the miracle there of the wedding in Cana, this too will come on with a family-centric theme, if you will, and a domestic theme, where we'll go from, <clears throat> in many ways, the script line of another poor Hugh Grant movie We'll go from the wedding of Cana to the funeral there in Bethany. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you're blessed among the nations. You have not seen a Hugh Grant movie. But anyway, with that being said, let's pray and then we'll dig into the Word of God. Father, we pray right now that you would speak. We pray in this moment right now, whether we're online, whether we're here in the room, Spirit of God, would you come? We want our lives to be shaped and informed by the Word of God. We want our lives to be redeemed and transformed through the Son of God. So Jesus, would you come into our lives in a powerful, fresh way? And Father, may our lives, through the ongoing work of your Spirit, bring glory to you in every part and shape and corner and shadow of our lives. And we pray this in your name. Amen and amen. So while Jesus never had a pad to call his own, there were many places where he could lay his head and spend a night or two or a week or two and be among the company of friends. So one of those places was where three siblings lived. And their place was in the humble abode of Bethany. And Bethany was a place of poverty in so many ways. And so these siblings lived in a place among poverty to where they had a small place. But Jesus, when he would approach their place in Bethany, just two miles away from Jerusalem, he was on a no-knock basis. You know what I mean by that? You just don't even knock. You just walk on in. He was on a no-knock basis there with them. But as much as his friends lived there, that was not the only thing that occurred in that house. For so that house where their friends lived, the sickness came. And with that, verse 1. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. And then John writes, and oh, by the way, verse 2, it was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. That is a reference to next weekend. It's also a reference to in the way that she would pour out her life upon Jesus and the, and the crucifixion that would occur in his life. And in many ways, John is writing this passage Looking back metaphorically through the victory of the resurrection, through, if you will, metaphorically, the open door of the tomb. 
He's looking back in time. And so much so, that informs much of what we will see today with the theme of death in regards to his life. Verse 3. With concern peaking among the sisters that this illness might take the life of their brother, the sisters, it says in verse 3, sent to Jesus, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. We don't know or learn about the details of the illness or the ailment. We don't know if it was a raging fever or really what it was. But what we do recognize here in this verse, in verse 3, is a twofold truth. And the twofold truth is found in a very, very simple statement. And the statement is this, Lord, he whom you love is ill. Jesus loved Lazarus, truth. Lazarus was ill, truth. And the reason I draw our attention to that is among certain circles and faith circles, even among the church, there are churches who have embraced embraced this notion that if indeed you love God or are loved by God, you won't get sick. In fact, so much so, there are these bereft theological doctrinal notions regarding affliction. And they're so dangerous if we don't create among ourselves a framework of suffering or a theology of affliction. So much so, what are those dangerous notions? Well, the first one might be this, that if you're a godly person, godly people ought not get sick. In fact, in Job, the book of Job, if you want to be encouraged this week about the state of your life, read the life of Job. Well, Job had some ironically named, I might say, some ironically named friends that came around him known as his comforters. Well, very comforting, I might add. So quite ironically, they were the comforters, and they came to Job, and they said, Job, we're really confused here because you strike us as godly, but clearly you're not because this wouldn't be happening in your life. That is the reality among some circles in church life, that if you're godly and you love God and you're loved by God, that you won't suffer affliction. The reality is experience and Scripture says otherwise. The other bereft theological notion regarding this is that if a person believes sufficiently God always heals. And I say that as a pastor, with it being a breath theological notion, I say that as a pastor who actually believes in the miraculous in the fourth dimensional realm to bring healing. But the reality is, while God always heals, it's not always this side of heaven. God always heals, I believe that, but it's not always this side of heaven. And there are people who love God who suffer greatly with affliction. And the reality is, Jesus himself, This is one of the most evocative, memorable moments in all of the Evangelion of John. In all of this, Jesus will actually leave Lazarus alone long enough to where he will actually pass into the afterlife. Meaning there was love and there was relationship, and yet even so, the pain rose in his life, and so much so, it took his life. The truth is, there are many reasons that we will suffer affliction. There are many reasons why you and I will go through times and seasons and situations of suffering and pain. Reality is that happens in our lives. The first one might be this. I'm going to give you four of them. The first one might even be that a test is permitted by God in order that he might present his glory to the world. Let me say it to you again. A test, not necessarily coming from the hand of God, but coming through the permission of God. There might be a test that would come into your life in order that the glory of God might be revealed. Jesus even says this about this affliction. It says in verse 4, this illness does not lead to death, which is kind of cryptic because it did, but it's for the glory of God so that the Son may be glorified through it. The reality is God will permit testing in our lives. God tested Abraham. God allowed there to be a testing in the life of Peter. Luke, it says in Luke's gospel, it says that Jesus said to Peter, the enemy has come in such a way to request that he might sift you like wheat." In other words, to put you over a filtration system to see if the small ones will fall through and if the big ones will remain. In other words, see if your faith is large enough to sustain itself. He says, but I've prayed for you. Says this in Luke's Gospel 22, 31. He says, Satan demanded that he might have you, that he might sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you. The word you there is not just Peter, singular. In the original language, that's plural. He's not saying, you, Peter. He's saying, Peter, you represent all people. That the enemy is going to come and demand that they, he might sift them and take away their faith. But I'm praying for you. And I'm praying for you that you might stand and reveal the glory of God through it. Another reason that we might fall sick or experience pain is as a consequence of our sin or as a consequence of someone else's. 
Think of the woman who was caught in adultery. There were two people, but Scripture speaks about this one woman. And Jesus says, I don't condemn you. But then he says to her, go ahead and leave your life of sin. In other words, there are consequences. The emotion that you're experiencing, the loss that you have in your marriage, the fact that your kids don't want to know you right now, there is a consequence to sin. And the reality is while God forgives sins, there are consequences that come alongside of sins and also the sins of others. Some of you have suffered affliction and suffering and sickness and pain. Why? Because your spouse created such of a situation where you're now the recipient of incredible pain. So number one, God permits testing to reveal and reveal the glory of God to all of creation. Number two, we see it in place where our sin or the sin of others. Number three, could be a demonic attack. We can have suffering in our lives because of a demonic attack. John 10.10. 10. Jesus says, I've come that you might have life and have life abundantly and have it overflowing. But guess what? Guess what? The enemy has come to steal, kill, and destroy. And as much as I don't believe theologically that there is a demon behind every bush and behind every car at Walmart, what I do believe to be true, though, is this. We have got to learn to live from the victory, not for the victory. We live in the victory of the cross, but we recognize there is a fourth dimensional realm. And there are two mistakes that we can do in regards to the demonic. You can either overly emphasize it to where you're in fear from it, or you can negate it and actually mitigate it and believe that there is no such thing to where you're influenced by it. I don't believe you can be possessed by it, but you can be influenced by it. If you've been purchased, you're now in the kingdom buggy. You're not in the demonic buggy. So he can't possess you because you're in a different buggy going through the aisles of Walmart, if you will, to continue that analogy. But you can be influenced by it. So a demonic attack, another one might be, it's the reality of a life in the fallen world. And more on that here in a little while. And while what I'm about to say might sound like a platitude, No matter what of those four it is in your life, an act of the enemy, the consequence of sin, the testing of the Lord, or the permitting of God for you to be tested by the enemy, here's the reality. And again, forgive me, it sounds like a platitude that you'd find on social media with somebody slapping a verse on it. But the reality is, Romans 8, 28, it's true. For God uses all these things. For those who are called according to his purpose, who love him, he will use all of those things to bring about this good work in our lives. He will redeem all things. And so much so, you might even say, the greater the pain, the greater the platform for God to show his glory. And I know that's hard. We're like, you're crazy, bro. It's so hard. I don't want pain. I don't want suffering. So what do we do? The reality is we have got to develop a framework of a theology of suffering. Because if not, we're so quick to jettison our trust at the very moment when our trust is being deepened and tested to where it can demonstrate to a watching world that we have been crafted and now treasured as a vessel for the glory of God. Let me say it to you again. Don't jettison your trust. Meaning, this is not of God. I am going through affliction. God does permit and God does allow those things in our lives. Don't jettison it too quickly, but say, God, what is it that I need to learn through this? Don't reject. Don't rebuke. Walk through with faithfulness because God uses seasons and situations to craft our lives. And we've got to embrace that. And the other reality here of having a faith frame that says, I've got space in my faith for a theology of suffering, is simply this, that otherwise we begin to believe that God's delays are his denials. I love what it was that Sandeep said recently in this series. Even in this John series, he said, God's delays are not his denials. And the reality, though, is if we don't have a theology of suffering, we say, see, God, you're late, you're rejecting me. You're not showing up, you've neglected me, you've forsaken me. So much so, reminding of that verse, we look at verse 5. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Verse 6, when Jesus heard that Lazarus was ill... He stayed two days longer in the place where he was. The name Lazarus literally means God is my help. And because of the name and the meaning of his name, and also because they knew they were loved by God, I'm sure they were like, wait, what? We sent word for you to come, and it's as if you're just like trivializing his affliction. And it's almost as if, I don't believe Jesus is doing this in in a way of making it, belittling it, but it's almost like Jesus says, oh, you're sick? Hey, boys, you want to go on a coffee run right now? The boy is sick, but it can wait. 
And I'll tell you, there are times in all of our lives when the reality is we say, God, I'm crying out to you right now. Now is not the time for you to go on a metaphorical coffee run. Now is not the time for you to be caught up and preoccupied by other things going on. I need you right now. And he goes, no, 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 it can wait. In fact, if that's your story and you're like, man, you have no idea. I'm praying and praying and praying for the prodigal. I'm praying and praying and praying for that pain to be gone. I'm praying and praying and praying for my marriage to get better. I'm praying and praying and praying that our son or our daughter who has some sort of learning challenge is all of a sudden now expedited and is able to make progress. And I'm praying, and God, you're not responding. I want you to know you're not alone. You're not alone. In fact, even among the early church fathers, they had a phrase for us. They called it Deus Abscondicus. Deus Abscondicus, the day that God is hidden. And they said, God, why are you hidden? There is the hidden nature of God, but God, why are you hidden when I need you the most? And I want to say this to you right now. If it feels as if you're crying out to God and God is like, hey, I'll be right back in two days. Here's what I want you to pray. I want you to keep knocking. I want you to keep waiting. I want you to keep praying. Luke 11 says this, because of your boldness in prayer, because of your boldness in prayer, he will rise and give you whatever it is that you need. And I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find and knock and it will be opened to you. The reality is when you can't see the hand of God, you need to trust and rely upon the character of God. And you need to trust in what it is and who it is and who he is in your life. But what's going on? The reality is Jesus says, hey, I know it's a problem, and I'll delay it two days. So what's going on? Well, as much as I'm telling us we need to pray, that's what Jesus is doing, I believe. I believe that Jesus is literally praying, and he is seeking the heart of the Father. Well, why? Well, first, I think he's seeking the heart of the Father to know the Father's will for his friend. I literally think he is saying, God, is this my friend's homecoming, or is this his healing? Is he to come home now? Or is he to be risen to new life? What is it that is on your heart for my friend? So he was praying, and he was praying for wisdom. He was talking to the Father. He was conversing with the Father. He even refers to this later in this passage, so I believe he is praying. But what else is he praying about? He's praying about the timing of the Lord in terms of Lazarus, but he's also praying for the timing of the Lord in his own life. Why? Well, if you were with us last week or you look at the preceding verses and the preceding chapter, you'll see that he once again runs out of Dodge. He gets out of the holy hub of Jerusalem. Why? Because the Judeans picked up some chunky rocks and they're like, bro, you go down this day. You're going down. So Jesus is like, I'm out of here. We jokingly say it was like the Jason Bourne move, but I believe it was because of the timing of the Lord. He stepped out of there. But he's praying right now, God... If I go back to Bethany, it's just a stone's throw away from Jerusalem. They're going to hear about it. I'm going to encounter some Jews. Is this a wise idea? And the father says, yes, go. So much so, he says to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. And the disciples said to him, bro, the Jews were only just seeking to stone you, and you're going there again, but now confident in the plan of God. Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. I can imagine his disciples were like, wait, what? That's so deep and that's so good, Jesus. But what on earth did you just say? That went right over our heads. We have no idea what it was that you just said. Here's what I think he is saying. The end of my life has been predetermined by God. And while I'm not going to be reckless and unwise, I'm invincible until it's the time my father has determined for the day of my passing. And you know what? Again, don't be unwise and reckless, but the same is true for you and I. We're invincible until it's God's time. After saying these things, verse 11, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Jesus, what are we now? A human alarm service? The bro is asleep. He will recover. Now Jesus said this to speak of his death, but they thought he meant taking a rest in sleep. And then Jesus said to them plainly, and by the way, you can tell I'm adding some stuff here. Guys, the bro's dead. Yes, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I am glad. Don't miss this moment. I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. 
And then they're almost like, oh, well, now that you say it that way, of course we've got to go to him. We love him. But then verse 16, so Thomas called the twin, and oh, how I love Thomas. He says to his fellow disciples, this is a brilliant idea. Let's all go that we might die with him. Like Thomas is like, maybe the undertakers are doing a group discount this week. Let's all go. Let's all like pull the plug at the same time. And yet at the same time, Thomas is actually indirectly prophetic. He nailed it, pun intended. He nailed it in that they were going and it would result in their death. But it's like, hey, you know what? Let's all go. I think it's a brilliant idea. Even on Team Jesus, Team Jesus had a Thomas. Anyway, verse 17. And when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their bro. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. How true this is to real life. Two different people with two different responses to trauma and bereavement. One of them runs, the other waits. One of them is so willing to talk and communicate, and the other doesn't want to talk to anyone. In fact, she doesn't want to even see anyone. And what we see in Jesus here is the heart of a good shepherd. Last week we talked about he is the good shepherd and we looked at what does that mean in the context of the way he shepherded the broken and the black sheep of the woman caught in adultery or the blind sheep that was being kicked out of the temple or all these different nuances. Well, in this case, he comes across two broken sheep and he cares for them. But notice what he does. To the one who is communicative, he talks. To the one who is crying, he weeps. And right here, right now, for all of us, it's kind of like a pro tip. It's like uh, the good shepherd, the senior leader of all church life, Jesus Christ, is giving us a pro tip here on how to deal with people and how to help people who are going through pain. And the principle is simply this. You match what you mean. You match what you mean. When you go into a time of crisis or when you step into a hospital room or when you step into someone's house who's going through significant sharp bereavement, one of the first things that we need to remember is this, we match what we meet. It says this in Romans 12, 15, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. So if you encounter crying, step into that space emotionally. If you encounter somebody who's running their mouth, and in the case of Martha, she's considering the spices to treat the meat, the shawarma at the reception, he's like, okay, we'll talk, we'll talk, we're talking, aren't we? But to Mary, she didn't want to come out yet. And in that regard, we match what we meet. But in the same way, I want to say something to you. The fact that Jesus showed up tells us the best principle about bereavement. And that is the ministry of presence. Just showing up. Just show up. Show up with a warm meal in your hands. Show up with a, with a gift. Show up with your presence and just be there. And be this non-anxious presence of just an arm around a shoulder or a hand entwined with another. And Jesus does that. Martha's faith, though, is stunning. Verse 21, she says to Jesus, Lord, here's what I know to be true about you. If you had have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. But then she says this, and I want you to underline these four words if they sound the same in your translation, if you're in the New Living or something like that. Maybe it doesn't say it this way, but if you're in the ESV, you can trust what it says in the Word of God. Here it is. But even now I know, underline that, now I know, now I know, even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Verse 24, Martha said to him, I know that. I know he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection. I'm the resurrection and the life. And whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She says to him, Lord, I believe it. And yes, I believe that you're the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world. That phrase, though he die, yet he shall live. You know, it's been said and considered throughout many times now of generations that the true test of a religion and the acid test of a religion, if you will, is what it does in terms of providing comfort at the end of one's life. The true test of religion, no matter what religion it is that people might subscribe to or adhere to, the true test of religion is basically does it provide comfort around the time 
of life ending. <clears throat> it is the great question of life. In fact, going back to Job for a moment, Job 14, 14 says, quote, if a man dies, shall he live again? So the question really in this passage right now before us all is, does death have the final word in our world? Does death have the final word in our world? Well, only about a week and a half ago, I was scrolling through a news site and I stumbled upon an article between two actors, Arnold Schwarzenegger and Danny DeVito. They were in a movie that I never saw called Twins, evidently. Well, they were talking about end of life matters. And I read this knowing that I would be in Lazarus here real soon. And really the question was framed to uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger and the question was, what do you think happens in terms of after death? And he simply said this, he goes, heaven is a fantasy. And he goes beyond this and he says, here's what I think happens after we breathe our last, essentially nothing. You're just six feet under and anyone that tells you something is an F blank liar. Some of this will be played out on Sunday, so we didn't want to say that out loud at church. He went on to say, we don't know what happens with the soul and all that other spiritual stuff, but I know, and don't miss this part, but I know that the body, as we see each other now, we will never see each other again like that. Arnold Schwarzenegger. Which is really ironic for me coming from the Terminator, because all I can think about is the phrase, I'll be back. But anyway, dad joke for the win, Father's Day and all. Seriously though, I believe that as Jesus was, now don't miss this moment either, I believe in the same way that Jesus was resurrected in bodily form, so too will we be. In fact, Greek mythology says we will come back in some sort of ethereal cloud-like sense, drinking Red Bull, riding on clouds, doing races against one another. That is Greek mythology. But Jesus and Christianity speaks about this bodily resurrection. So I might say Jesus goes to Thomas, going back to Thomas for a moment, and says, Thomas, see, I want you to believe. I don't want you to have unbelief or disbelief. I want you to believe. He says, so much so, Thomas was thinking, I, I don't know if I want to do it. My hand's going to go right through the body. And he goes, no, 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 bro. Put your hand right here. And Thomas goes, in that same way, I believe that this is a prototype of the resurrection that we will experience when the Lord returns and he declares all things like new again. So much so, Paul writes this to those in Rome in Romans 8, 11. He says, the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, enabling Jesus to be presented before Thomas, is living in you and I. He has raised Christ from the dead and he will also give that same life to you and your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Friends, I believe that unlike Arnold Schwarzenegger, I believe that we will see one another again as God declares all things like new again. But with that, we've got to get back to verse 28. Martha went and called her sister Mary and she said in private, Mary... The teacher's here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. <clears throat> when the Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they assumed she was heading out to the tomb to weep and so following. But now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying, Lord, Lord, if you would only have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. This passage aches with pain. And for some of us right now, we are visualizing the last situation that we found ourselves in regarding a family member or friend where we experience this degree of weight and agony and literally tears falling from the cheeks of our faces, landing on the pages, metaphorically, of our lives. There's this incredible pain. What do we see? We see Mary blurting out her pain. Jesus, if you would have been here, you have no idea. We're friends. We've shared meals together. We've done life together. You don't even knock when you get to the house. You walk on in. If you would have been here, I heard rumor that you delayed it two days. Do you have any idea, Jesus? 
and then Jesus is wrecked. The word who became flesh for us wept aloud. And it says two things. He was deeply moved and he was greatly troubled. In other words, he was moved and mad at the same time. He was moved with emotion and he was mad at something that was occurring. The word associated in the original language there of that verse 33, I believe it is, speaks about this great anger, and it literally means this. It literally means that when Mary blurted out her pain, it says, quote, Jesus snorted like a horse. That's literally the translation. You ever been so cut up, you can't even regulate your tears? You're so cut up that you're not only broken, you're also angry. And it's almost that moment where your mind can't keep up with the emotions that are flowing out. He snorted like a horse. He's like, I, I can't do this. Why? Here's why. It's rooted in the creation account. He was moved and he was mad. Why was he mad? I believe that Jesus is mad because this kind of thing should never have happened. It need not have happened. And Jesus is so angry with the devil for introducing death into the world and seeing it destroy a family that he loved. And he's so moved because he sees his friend in grief. He's so mad because of what the enemy has done to unleash pain and agony in the world. And friends, here's the truth. God's good creation, all of the dirt, all of the soil, God never intended for any of that soil to be called a cemetery and to house the dead. He never intended it for that. So much so because of that, even the Jewish lineage and Judaism, all this generation of millennia on now has such a high regard and reverence for dead. Why? They go, the dead shouldn't be put into the ground like this. And so he's so moved, he's so mad and... Friends, the reality is this, a message like this creates emotion and like you, I long for that day, Revelation 21.4, when it says that he will wipe away all of the tears from our eyes and there will be no more pain or sorrow. And that day when the curtains will open in that final scene, that final act, Revelation 21.5, behold and I will make all things like new. Again, my prayer that God that day when you will wipe away every tear of my face and I will see my dad's mom who I have never met who died shortly before I was born. Or I will get to wrestle the little boy inside of me that longs to wrestle once again with my granddad who died far too young. That he will wipe away every tear. That's why he's mad. So what is it that we're to do in this in-between place? In this in-between place, we are to redeem every part of dirt every square mile, every opportunity, every relationship for this grand restorative work. To bring about worship to the nations. To build churches for people's lives to be changed. To establish restoration centers so that people have a friend to grieve alongside of. Why? Because it wasn't meant to be like this. And for this reason, Jesus shuddered. And he said, where have you laid my friend? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And then the shortest verse in the Bible, memorize, memorize this one, verse 35, Jesus wept. Friends, can I tell you right now that Jesus withholds sovereignty and withholding sovereignty knows the end of this story and he still cried. Why is he crying though? Because he knows no matter what he does in the next few minutes, Lazarus will die again. And so he cries. He goes, yeah, I know he's going to come back here in like no time. But in no time, he will be back in that place again. And this is not what I wanted. The Jews said, look, he's real. He loves people. But some of them said, well, surely if he's so powerful, and I'm paraphrasing, if he could have opened the eyes of the blind, surely he could have kept this man from dying. But verse 38, then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it, and Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, no, let's, let's not do this. There's going to be an odor. He's been dead for four days. And Jesus said to her, Martha, sweetheart, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Friends, in the moment, 
when it really mattered, Martha's faith failed her. But that's such good news for us because ours does too. Every day. Heal my mom, heal my dad, heal me. Heal my daughter as she's in this hospital bed. God, I believe, but I, I don't. But I want to. Help me in my unbelief. So they, in partnering with God in the miracle is what I've written parenthetically in my word, meaning they helped move away the stone. Jesus then lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. By the way, I believe that is the part that refers to the 48 hours of prayer. He's saying, God, I know you heard me. That's the reason I waited. I knew this moment would come. I need to know you were with me. I know you heard me. And I know that you always hear me for that matter. But I said this on account of those standing around that they might believe that you sent me. And when he said these things, oh, come on now. One of the most dramatic moments in all of the storyline of scripture. When he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice. One, two, three. Lazarus, come on out. Unlike the daughter, Jairus' daughter, where he asked many to leave the room, this time he didn't care. He's like, y'all can stay here if you want. I'm putting my reputation on the line. I'm going to show you who it is that is empowering my life as I'm fully man, yet also fully God. And he cries out with a loud voice. I love what C.H. Spurgeon says about this part. C.H. Spurgeon, a now long deceased British preacher, said, quote, if he wouldn't have called out Lazarus by name, he would have emptied the whole darn graveyard. <laughs> love that. Verse 44, the man who had died came out. Come on. His hands and his feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. And then Jesus said to them, and I've got to tell you what I've written parenthetically in my, my Bible. Don't just stand there stunned. He can't see where he's going. He's got a shroud over his eyes. Unbind the man and then let him go. Friends, I realize this weekend I've gone a little long, but there are a few more comments I want to say here. Lazarus is a picture of salvation. We're dead. We're dead. Lazarus didn't say as a dead man, Jesus, give me a moment. I don't want to come out with this shroud over my face. I want to clean up my appearance. He was dead. Dead men don't have dialogue. But then all of a sudden, life came. And he came out of the tomb. He came out of the grave by grace. It's a picture of salvation. And as we come alive through the power of God, as we come alive in salvation, he then says, okay, take off those dead men's clothes because you've got a life to live. Yeah. Friends, it's a picture of salvation. There are two things that he says. First, he says, unbind him. Friends, I want to say to those of you online, also those of us in the room right now, put on your new identity in Christ. Don't come out of the tomb and walk around in dead men's clothing. Isaiah says it this way, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments, come on, of salvation. He has now covered me with a robe of righteousness. Friends, dead man clothes don't fit living people. Take them off. Take off the blood stain of sin and put upon the robe of righteousness that has been declared white through the sacrifice of Christ. He also says, let him go. Friends, there is a time in all of our lives where Jesus didn't bring Lazarus out of the grave to say, stand there, look back into that grave and realize where you have once come from. Rather, he says, go. Friends, in all of our lives, there is a time when we've got to walk away from the grave. Some of you are still standing at the grave of your greatest regret. Some of you are still residing at that place of your greatest pain. You were rejected by your father and God gave you a new family. Don't keep living in that old place. Walk away from that grave. God restored your purity and you felt like, no, 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 I'm full of shame. No, 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 God has spoken life over you. Don't stay there at the grave. Let God unbind you and let God call you on into a place of walking in your new identity as a child of God. Amen. 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 Father, we pray right now that we would be a people while dead in our sin. 
would be awakened by the word of the one who is very much alive. So Father, right now, I pray that through the words of your son and through the work of your spirit, you would unbind us, take off our dead man clothing, our dead man clothing, our dead woman clothing, our young person's dead clothing, that we might go, that we might rise up and walk with conviction and boldness for what it is that you have prepared for us in advance for us to do. Lord, I pray for the power of the resurrection to be flowing in our lives. As Paul wrote to the Romans, that same power that rose Christ from the dead. Jesus, even now as I'm praying, I'm I'm realizing that in that moment, as the stone was rolled away and you saw life come forth, you're like, that's going to be me. Thank you for laying down your life for us, that we can have life in you and have it to the abundance. We pray these things in your mighty, precious name. And everyone said, amen and amen. We are so glad that you joined us this weekend. And I would just encourage you, read ahead, read into John 12 as we progress into the week and join us next weekend as we jump into another message in this awesome series in the book of John. We love you, Mountain Springs. We hope you have an amazing week.